we'll give folks a minute to get to get in. Let's give folks a few minutes here. Welcome for those of you who are coming in. Folks, we're going to give people just a minute or two to jump in, and then I will go ahead and start things. All right, well, I'll go ahead and start and people can kind of join us midstream and uh, good evening to everyone and welcome to tonight's presentation of the 2022-2023 Humanity Center, Center Fellows, including Dr. Sheena Harris of History and the Program Coordinator of Africana Studies, Dr. Nancy Coronia of English, and Dr. Jay Crable of Political Science. And uh, each of these folks are gonna present for us tonight and uh, at the end of, the, of all the presentations, I will go ahead and moderate questions. Um, so please use the Q&A feature um, if you do have questions and uh, at the end, I will ask as many as time allows. And tonight's order will be Nancy Coronia followed by Sheena Harris and finishing with Jay Crable. So with that, Nancy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Renee. I really appreciate um, being able to share some of what I did on my research trip. And I'm really excited to share where my research is at right now. So thank you everybody for being here. And thank you to the WVU Humanities Center for supporting my work. As a teaching associate professor in the Department of English, I don't have any research time allotted during the semester. So it's difficult for me to actually get any work done. Um, I was fortunate this year to have a sabbatical that coincided with this fellowship. And the fellowship allowed me to work on my book, Permeable Boundaries, about um, women writers of Italian descent and the kinds of ways in which they discuss agency, belonging, sexuality, and work um, through the lenses of migration. Um, in this work, I was able to spend, I spent almost five weeks in Scotland and then another week and a half in Rome. And I started out um, in Scotland going up to the Highlands. And I wanna talk a little bit about what just being out of the country meant to me to start. You can see this is a picture of me at Dunrobin Castle up in the Highlands with a peregrine falcon. Um, the sense that I had of being in Scotland and feeling safe in a way that I don't necessarily feel in the United States was just eye-opening for me, and it really allowed me to, to dig deep um, in the way that I wanted to work and also the way in which I wanted to think about not only the project that the Humanities Fellowship supported, but other projects that I have. Um, why is this not moving? There we go. So at Dunrobin Castle, I, I just wandered around in a castle and I happened upon this shoe and I went, what is this? Because the detailing, the embroidery was so intricate. And as I approached it, it's a shoe from Garibaldi. Um, and what it was, it was acquired somehow from when he went to Stafford House in London in 1854 and it wound up 
in the Highlands of Scotland and has lived there since 1854. I was fascinated by this castle because they also had other volumes about Garibaldi throughout the house. Um, and it was clear that they were pro-Republic. Um, some people might not know this, but Italy only became a country in 1872 as it is as its structure today. So I didn't realize that Garibaldi's influence or was influenced through not just the United Kingdom, but particularly in Scotland. My guess is that the laird of the castle probably bought that shoe to fund one of Garibaldi's campaigns. And the reason that I start my talk with this is because this was an unexpected find. But I have another project on dime novels, and there are a few dime novels about Garibaldi. So when I return to this project, I have this newfound respect for and understanding of how far reaching Garibaldi's influence was. Um, and so I found it ironic. And when I turned to the curator and I said, Garibaldi's shoe, and he goes, yeah, we have it. You know, it was just kind of a, a weird thing, but they understood that it was important. I want to talk about what I really did in Scotland um, and what the work of the fellowship really supported. When I was in Scotland, I interviewed the playwright and director Laura Passetti, who was a recent immigrant to Scotland. She is from Italy, but but immigrated or migrated because she goes back and forth between Scotland and um, Italy and lives in Fintorn, which is in the Highlands. And I also talked with and interviewed the memoirist and poet Anna Pia about her work, um, Language of My Choosing. And we talked a lot about immigration and women's work in Scotland. I also met with University of St. Andrews professor Derek, Derek Duncan, who writes a lot about Italian film and cin cinema, but he's working on a book that's not dissimilar to mine in that he's trying to move um, discussions of migration and gender away from large cities and is looking at smaller cities in much the same way that I do in the United States when I'm looking at writers like Denise Giardina. And then I was able in Scotland to visit a lot of Italian immigrant neighborhoods that have remained either stable or you can see the ways in which that they've been um, gentrified or the Italians have moved out of those neighborhoods. I also conducted research at the National Library of Scotland and the University of Edinburgh Library on playwrights, poets, and television writers, Maria de Mambro and Marcello Evaristi. And this was really the crux of why I wanted to go to Scotland because their works are not available to me in the United States. So I literally had to go to the archives and sit and I took a lot of pictures and a lot of notes because I could not access their works anywhere but in these, in these places and in Glasgow as well. But really I got what I needed in those two places. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit first about Marcella Evaristi. So Marcella Evaristi was born in Glasgow and now lives in Rome. But what's interesting to me about both Marcella Evaristi and Maria and de Mambro that is different than in the United States is that their work in the 1970s and 1980s really took place in this moment where Italo Scott women playwrights were being fully funded and fully supported. And to me, that's very unusual. Like every work that they did is documented in the National Archives or at the University of Edinburgh and in sometimes in both places because they were fully funded in the 70s and 80s to write all, anything that they wanted. And Marcello Evaristi's work in particular is quite experimental in that she's writing plays about women, Italian, Italian Scott women who are having affairs with much younger men. And this is, you know, in the 70s and 80s, she's writing tone poem plays. And, and she continued to do that throughout the 70s and 80s. And there's a body of work on her work. But the irony is, is that I cannot access it outside of Scotland, that in order to access it and do the work that I needed to do for my own book, I had to go and I had to sit there and I had to read. In some cases, as you can see in this yellow picture, in this image of the yellow paper, <clears throat> it's literally courier typeface 
on sheets of paper that look like they're falling apart. And, and this isn't that long ago, but I, it was fascinating to me that these archives are there, that the acts that the only way I could access them is through this. And she's a very well-respected playwright. So there's a lot written on her, but at the same time, the access to her works is almost impossible unless you're in country. Um, what did I just do? I'm sorry. I just did something that I didn't want to, I'm going to stop and start it again. Sorry about that. So Anne-Marie de Mombro is a really interesting person. She's from Glasgow. She still lives in Glasgow, but she has become a very well-known name in television producing, writing, and even some directing. And she's most well-known for a play called Tally's Blood. And Tally's Blood, written in 1990 for the Traverse Theater in Edinburgh, um, it was commissioned by Ian Brown, who was the then artistic director of the theater company. And he very clearly said in 1987 or 1988, I really want to do a play about Italian immigration. And Anne-Marie turned to him and said, if you commission it, I'll write it because if anybody else writes it, I'll never speak to you again. So she wrote this play, Tally's Blood, which is very, I think, daring, right? But she wrote this play about World War II in Scotland and about a family who has a cafe an ice cream shop that plays music and they live in, in Leith and they're there. And what happens is, is World War II starts. Um, Mussolini declares war and all the shops in the neighborhoods in Edinburgh in Glasgow and around, and also in London, they get destroyed. And Rossinello who works in the shop gets the phone call that says, you gotta leave the shop because they're coming to destroy everything. And so all of these um, Italian migrants who have these shops wind up losing almost everything. Um, they have to rebuild from scratch. But what, and it happens, that happens in March of 1940. And then in July of 1940, the men, the Italian men who are not nationalized in Scotland, who have been born in Italy, start to get picked up. And there's 971 men who get put on a ship called the Arandora Star. And when they, take them out to sea because they're bringing them to a, a camp to hold a POW camp to hold on to them and what happens is is the ship is painted gray it was a cruise ship liner but it gets painted gray and the Germans don't realize that it's carrying POWs including 371 um, Germans and they shoot the ship and almost every single Italian man dies on that ship and what winds up happening is is that the women of these towns with these shops are all then forced to sort of step into the role of the breadwinner. And so Tally's blood is about the prejudice, not only the prejudice that is that the Italians face, but also how one character in particular, Rosanella, the woman who is working hard while her husband is away, he winds up not dying, but they have a they have a an, an uncle who dies on the Arandor star. And the prejudice that she feels towards those who actually live, the poorer Scots, and how she is very much someone who wants to keep everyone else out. And it actually destroys a few lives. Her prejudice destroys a few lives. So it's an interesting construction of work, of women's work. And I was surprised when I, I talked to Anna Pia from Language of My Own Choosing because her family grew up with a shop and there were no men in her family. It was just the women. So her grandmother ran the shop and then her mother ran the cafe, the shop in Morningside in Edinburgh. And she talks very specifically about how they ran the show. They did the books, they did everything, the ordering, they were up early in the morning till late at night. And this kind of construction for me is different than what I read from fiction writers in the United States. Fiction writers who are writing about women in the United States write a lot about women at home, the domestic side of the work, the labor, the unpaid labor at home. And both Anne-Marie de Mombro and Anna Pia are really writing about this sort of public facing work where they have to be involved with the public. They have to face the people that have destroyed their shops, right? These are the same people that used to come and buy ice cream every day. And then they turn around and destroy 
destroy the shop. And then a month later, they're back in the shop buying ice cream again or sitting and having uh, an aperitivo while they're listening to, to music on the Victrolas. And so I, I find this to be sort of an interesting construction, not only of work, but of how women need to be in the public sphere. Um, Anne-Marie de Mambo's play back in the late 90s, early 2000s, then becomes a staple of diversity, of diverse literature in the public schools in Scotland. And you can see here this yellow book. This is a book that is given to um, 9, 10, 9th and 10th and uh, the equivalent 9th and 10th and 11th graders, where they are taught about Tally's blood. And Tally is um, simply a, a term for Italians in Scotland. And blood has to do with it. Tally's blood, meaning family, but also the red um, raspberry sauce that they put on ice cream is all, it's considered blood, Tally's blood. It's, so it has this double and triple meaning to what is, you know, what is familial, what is kinship, and how do we spill our blood, and in what name do we spill our blood? But this play is taught, it was taught regularly in, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, alongside other works by like um, Ali Smith and um, Jackie Kay. So this to the, in Scotland, this is considered a piece of, um, of diversity. Um, I think part of it has to do with the fact that Anne-Marie de Mambro is very well known in Scotland as a television producer and a television writer, so that she also had connections to make sure that her play is better known. But her other plays, this is the only play that gets any kind of um, public and national recognition ongoing. Her other plays, um, Thunder Brothers, which is about HIV and AIDS, is less well known. She has another play, Joe, about um, Italians, not unlike Tally's Blood. Again, it's much less well known. And so you have to, I had to go to Scotland to read them. Now, I want to talk, I just want to talk a little bit more about how important it was for me when I saw the neighborhoods, especially in Edinburgh, some of those neighborhoods are intact. Some of the shops don't exist as the shops that they were 50 years ago, but they're still there and there are still markers. And so when I was walking through, through these neighborhoods, I was struck by how much still remains even after World War II, even after the 70s and the 80s and people moving out and moving up. And, and it really struck me, especially when I talked to Ann Pia, about this, the way in which Italo Scots who have been there for two or three generations are still not in many ways assimilated in the way that Italian American women writers are or Italian Americans are in the United States. And so it's given me a lot to think about in terms of the way that I want to approach this work. Not only these playwrights, but also Laura Pacetti, who wrote a play that was not unlike Tally's Blood, but unlike Tally's Blood, which has a happy ending, doesn't have a happy ending. Um, it's been made into a film, and I talked with her about why she did that. So as I'm thinking about these ideas of family and blood and women's work, I really keep returning to the differences that I saw in Scotland, especially from the work that I'm doing on say, Denise Giardina here in Appalachia or um, Louise de Salvo from Hoboken, New Jersey. When I went, um, I do wanna say one more thing. When I was in Scotland, the queen died. So, so things for me, when I was there, I had to really reassess for a whole week. Edinburgh was crazy. The trains weren't running correctly. The library closed, the library opened. So I had to just be there as the queen came into town, you know, when they said goodbye to her. And it was a very eye-opening experience because there were many people there who were clearly not royalists, but they had this deep respect for the queen who had done all this work for so long. So it was very interesting for me to be there at that time. And when I left Scotland and I left the Queen, I then went to Rome um, at a time when they had just elected um, the most far right government since World War II. 
And so I entered where after leaving Scotland, where the police during when the queen was there, I didn't know they were police. I, I was like, why are there so many crossing guards? There were no weapons. There were no Uzis. There, were, there was nothing. And I got to Rome and on every corner there were Kevlar vests and Uzis and Jeeps. And so the police were militarized there. So it was a little shocking. But when I was in Rome, I was able to meet with Carlo Perozzi, the director of Italian language schools at the Dante Alighieri Society. And I met with him because he did his PhD, he did his doctoral work in Scotland and had a lot of information for me and connections for me in Scotland about, about Italian migration there. I also talked with him though about study abroad because I said, I really don't wanna do a tour anymore. I want something more personal if I bring students. And we had a long talk about that. I also had the opportunity to present my work on Denise Giardina at the Taboo Conference at the Tor Vergata in University of Rome. And then I conducted research at the Associazione Nazionale Pligli Interessi del Mezzogiorno d'Italia, the National Association for the Interests of Southern Italy. And I went there because I wanted to understand the majority of people who left Italy left, um, left through Southern Italy. So I wanted to go and I wanted to look at documents. But what happened when I got there was I found relatives that I didn't know existed. So I was looking through the card catalog files because they had a very old system and I was pulling things out and I was looking at them. And then just for, you know, I don't know why I did it. I said, oh, let me see if my name is in here because I'm from Sicily. And I found Giuseppe Caronia, who is the guy here on the left-hand side. And Giuseppe is, was a professor at University of Rome. He was a sociologist and a humanist and who wrote about Sicily and Calabria his whole life. And over here is his, I think this is his brother, his uncle, his father, Salvatore Caronia Roberti. And I've included on the right-hand side, the names of all the men in the room. And I, I was struck by this document because everyone has a name except for the woman who is Una Interpreta. And this is from 1960. And I think that this is a very telling sign of the state of women in Italy, not only at this time, but I think still, that everybody in the room has a name but the interpreter, and she's the only female figure here. But this opened me up because I come from, I'm a first gen call, all right, you know, I'm a first gen college student with nobody who ever supported me through my PhD program, working class. And I found this man who is more than likely a great, great uncle who was a prolific scholar writing about urban life in Sicily, writing about people in, you know, uh, architects and sculptors in Calabria and just really doing his work. And it, you know, I have a third project that's about my own family. And I thought, well, this is just a weird feeling for me to find this and to realize that there are people in my own life who actually are indeed, um, you know, scholars. So my future plans are, I'm gonna continue working on permeable boundaries. I'm going to learn more Italian because I wanna conduct research in Sicily and Calabria. And once permeable boundaries is complete, I'm gonna to return to the dime novel manuscript, including work on Garibaldi. And then I wanna think again about study abroad through the lens of migration and work. I appreciate this fellowship because it gave me time to be expansive, something that I just cannot do during my regular work day. Um, I know we're going to move on, but I, if you have questions, you can contact me at my email address. So thank you, everybody, for indulging me. Great. And Sheena, if you'd like to... Okay, can you hear me? All right, good. So uh, my name is Sheena Harris and I use the Humanities Fellowship in order to expand my research on a woman by the name of Olivia America Davidson Washington, who also was born in a state that would become 
West Virginia shortly after she actually moved away in 1860. And so I'll sort of talk about how I came to the project, what were some of the big questions that I had as I was going into the project, and some of the challenges of finding these Black women who were born during this institution of slavery in the archives. And so, let's move. All right, so one of the, the larger questions that I had in looking at Olivia and Fannie Smith, which I'll talk about in a moment, was really retelling or telling this larger story about Tuskegee Institute. And so in, in 2021, I published a book on Booker T. Washington's third wife, Margaret Murray Washington. And in doing that, one of the things that came up was that the reason why I'm telling this story through the lens of Margaret Murray Washington is one, there's so little that was already published and already in the archives about his first two wives. The other thing was that oftentimes when the story of Tuskegee University is told, it's generally told through the lens of these three men that you see here on your screen, Lewis Adams, Booker T. Washington, and George Campbell. And just the quick story is that Lewis Adams is the initial think tank behind the formation of the school. He had in Tuskegee, Alabama, a small 10 school that he was attempting to educate many of the locals who were just recently removed from this institution of slavery. He then solicited the help of George Campbell, who also happened to be a former slave owner, a businessman within Alabama as a way of soliciting or getting some financial help. So they basically came together to get the school incorporated. And then they, they solicited the help of Booker T. Washington, who is also a native of West Virginia as well, to head the school in Tuskegee. And then oftentimes from that narrative, it is Tuskegee became this institution that it is today because largely of these three men. And oftentimes the women who played a larger role within not only the starting of the school, but also the maintenance of the school oftentimes were deleted or at best, they are often monolithic, that their roles are generally seen as one of um, helping or supporting in some way or caring for the children in some way and not really seen as administrators or institution builders. And so I really wanted to go back into the beginning and figure out who were these women. And so when I started talking with the Humanity Center, one of the things that I had done at that point was I wrote an article that looked at the early life of Fannie Norton Smith and Olivia America Davidson. Fannie Norton Smith was born in West Virginia in 1858, and she becomes Booker T. Washington's first wife. Olivia Davidson also is born in Mercer County, um, Virginia, which later becomes West Virginia in 1854. And she becomes Booker T. Washington's second wife. And while writing the article for the second volume of Blacks in Appalachia, the thing that really came to the fore was Olivia Davidson is really dynamic in a way that the historical narrative does not show. And in ways that many of the things that she did in order to build the Institute of Tuskegee, oftentimes over the years has just been given to her husband. And so this project has been an amazing way of one going into the archives to rediscover where Olivia is and her contributions to education at Tuskegee, but also to her contributions to education throughout the nation as well. And then this last image on the end is of Margaret Murray Washington, who becomes Booker T. Washington's third wife. 
and who, who ultimately is going to help to carry many of the earlier initiatives that Olivia America Davidson and Fanny Norton Smith started into 1925 and the present. And so with the fellowship, Olivia America Davidson came to the forefront. And there were just some amazing things that were discovered. And I think one of the challenges that I spoke of earlier that was discovered with Olivia is that at first glance, she's not in the archives. And so in order to be able to retell her story, there had to be some very creative ways of going through the archives. And one of those creative ways of doing it is that I had to go through the archives of men who oftentimes she was also associated with and through the institutions that she went to. And so with the grant, one of the things that I also was able to do was to write my chapter two and my chapter three of the book. And so what I'm just going to talk about today is just briefly some of the things that Olivia did within her very short lifespan um, that led her into Tuskegee prior to getting there. And that really was the focus of many of the archival digs that I did um, within this last year with the grant. So Olivia America Davidson is born in 1856 in Mercer County, Virginia. She is going to be born to a mother and a father who were interestingly born free. And although they were born free, they still are not in the archives. And so um, tracing much of that was very difficult, especially within West Virginia. And so most of what is really found about the early life of Olivia America is going to be found in Ohio and in the Ohio archives. And so in 1860, her family moves from Mercer County into Athens. While they're in Athens, Olivia is also going to have this very unique opportunity to be educated and to be educated amongst freemen and to be educated amongst our what is considered this co-curricular type of educational or co-ed co educational facility. And in this co-ed educational facility, she's interestingly going to be classmates with many men who are then eventually going to be businessmen in Ohio. And because she's classmates with these businessmen in Ohio, these businessmen are going to eventually be a part of her later husband's business endeavors for Blacks. And so that archive also was a wealth of knowledge in terms of them talking about their school years and their school time in Athens, Ohio with Olivia. In 1871, Olivia ultimately is going to leave Ohio and she's going to travel to Hernando, Mississippi. And this is really going to start where Olivia becomes a educator. And she's going to use much of her schooling that she's getting within the Appalachian region in the Southern region. Many of the travels that she's able to do are also sort of fleshed out within this particular chapter. But the other thing that happens that is very dramatic for Olivia and that really is going to be a um, shift in the way that she thinks about education and the way that she thinks about education for Black folk within this particular time period is that while teaching in Hernando, Mississippi, her brother is going to be lynched by the local Ku Klux Klan in 1876. And while for some this would detour them from pursuing education, this is only going to heighten what she wants to do and how she is going to use education as this vehicle. And so what we see from there is Olivia Davidson really getting funds from philanthropists within the North to help fund her education. She's going to get funding from um, President Hayes's wife to go to Hampton Institute. She's going to get funding from other philanthropists within Massachusetts to go to Framingham State Normal School before she enters her work in Tuskegee. And one of the fascinating things that was found through this research 
is that most of the, the institutional um, curriculum that we find in Tuskegee prior to 19, 1900 is ultimately going to come from Olivia. And it's going to come from Olivia's schooling within Ohio and her teaching throughout the South prior to getting to um, Alabama. And so the way that the story is unfolding and the way that the archives is also really opening up as I look into different ways of exploring who are these Black women? Who are these Black women associated with? And how can we turn the silence that we oftentimes see with Black women who are born during this institution of slavery into voice, right? And so that's been, I think, by far one of the most fascinating things that I've, I've been able to discover through the grant and with the archival um, digs that I've had, and just how three-dimensional and how this ultimately changes the narrative not just of this individual woman, but also how we think about these great men um, who leave and, and leave their biographies and leave their autobiographies behind. And this is just an overview of the chapter breakdowns that I'm moving into with this book. And one is looking at her girlhood within the Appalachian region, looking at her education and how that education is influencing her teaching. But then I think the strong points that really are changing the way that the, the larger master narrative is told is looking at how she is building this institute that becomes known as Tuskegee University and how she is being and how she's able to become a traveler during this time where black bodies really aren't moving um, and black women really aren't moving within these spaces that are extremely dangerous and then how that translates into building out this gendered curriculum and this home or this black home as well. And any questions that you have, I know I went through a lot in a very short period of time, but I'm willing to answer any questions that you have then. Thank you. Shall I just jump in here? Please do. All right. Let me get this going. All right. Everyone can hear me. Looks all right. Good. All right. So this project is, um, it's a, a new project actually for me. So it's been Fascinating to hear the the previous two, which I have to say, going third, the, the disadvantage is I've been so focused and interested in what you all have to say. I now have to shift my mind back to what I have to say. Um, but, but this project uh, started from something of a personal experience. So uh, my family and, and I are, are citizens of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. And in 2020, the Supreme Court issued a, a pretty significant decision referred to as the McGirt uh, decision. And basically the short version of what that case did was it reestablished tribal reservations in the state of Oklahoma that most everyone had assumed had been uh, disestablished at statehood. Turned out that wasn't the case according to the Supreme Court and it kind of shocked everyone, including myself. And it got me thinking about how my own sort of perceptions of, of the court changed with that one decision and what's possible and what, uh, you know, how the court operates and how it conceives of, of issues related to, to Indian law. And so from that, we sort of wanted to build out the, the project. And as it so happened, uh, some events in the world have made it, I think, all the more interesting, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in this uh, discussion today. So just a little bit of background. You may have heard the Supreme Court's been in the news a little bit. You know, there's some stuff going on. I don't think I need to go into great detail, but the, the court's decisions, along with some of the, the recent appointments that have been fairly contentious and, and shifted a lot of the conversation about the court, 
uh, have had a number of consequences, but one of those has been a pretty prodigious drop in, in public support uh, and how people perceive uh, our, our judicial system, but particularly the Supreme Court, such that support has come to some of the lowest levels since the big survey firms have been asking people about this. And just to give a few figures for context, right? so this is asking people about their trust and confidence, less than half of Americans saying that they have a greater deal or fair amount of, of trust and confidence in the court. Uh, similarly, job approval, right, underwater. And if you look at that over the trends, even just going back to the early 2000s, how much that's, that's changed. Again, this is for the, the population overall, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And, and one of the things that a lot of discourse is focused on is uh, partisan shifts and how uh, polarization is starting to creep into how people view the, the, the court. And so if you look here, right, and this is late 2022, the, the favorable opinions of the Supreme Court are much higher among Republicans than they are among Democrats. And that's then borne out if we start to look at other uh, trends as well, looking uh, for example, at education uh, and, and so on. But in this project, what I wanted to do is shift away from this discussion about partisanship and start to think more about how the courts understood among the group that I'm a part of and that, that seemed particularly important to me, which is Native Americans, and trying to see and, and better understand how uh, different parts of the Native American community react to the court's decisions and just generally how they view the Supreme Court. And so I'm gonna give a little bit of, of background here and that Native Americans have kind of a unique relationship with, with the federal government. There's 574 federally recognized tribes, which includes uh, Alaska Native communities. Uh, and these are self-governing sovereign entities, their own governments, laws, courts, citizenship procedures and requirements, uh, often their own clinics and health systems, a whole slew of things uh, that, that these tribes provide for their citizens. And so as a result, they're in a sense political entities, much like nations or states. And then many of those sort of aspects I was just describing, they function very similar to that. Uh, and that the constitution gives the federal government explicit authority to then regulate and negotiate the matters between the tribes and, and their citizens. So there's a, very much a relationship here between uh, the federal government and, and Native American tribes. And this is where the Supreme Court has come in to, to play in a, in a very important way that uh, I think people throughout Indian country recognize. In fact, there's a whole area of jurisprudence for federal Indian law uh, that uh, you can go to law schools, and there are some that specialize in, in training in this. It's, it's a very much a salient part of, of, uh, sort of the politics and policy in, in Indian country. And so the Supreme Court's taken on a, a major role in determining what tribal sovereignty looks like. That is, what are the things the tribes can and can't do, or the federal government can or can't do or must do, and states as well. Um, and a lot of these decisions are like the ones I was just describing that uh, the McGirt decision, they're focused a lot on questions of tribal sovereignty and what are the rights that natives have in different contexts? What are the obligations of the, the federal government in terms of their treaty and, and statutory obligations? These things that really have a direct impact on, on people's often everyday lives. They're not just high policy or high politics. These are, are very much directly relevant to the, the well-being of, of Native people. And this role is kind of complex. So when I heard about the McGirt decision, and it was kind of a shock to me, in a way, I was surprised. We don't typically expect to win in the, in the Supreme Court. It's kind of, I think, a, some level built-in uh, predisposition. But Native tribes are also kind of reliant on the court for these kinds of decisions. And so it raised this question to me of right, how much do Native Americans really trust the Supreme Court to guarantee the very rights that we know the court's going to have to protect or ensure for us? If the court decides, as I'll talk about in a second with this pending decision that the projects come to focus on, uh, if the court decides it wants to uh, effectively do away with tribal governments, 
it very well may be able to do so. And so uh, what I wanted to, to do, and as the project has developed, is try to, to gain more, more perspective from both uh, leaders in the Native American community, and I'll talk about that some, but also to look at sort of the, the broader community and, and how people perceive the court and the potential uh, risks to uh, tribal, tribal sovereignty and Native American rights. And so to do that, I'm, I'm starting to focus on a, this dynamic in a per, the life of a particular case that I'm going to talk about in a second, which is uh, called Brackeen v. Holland, which some of you may be, be familiar with that think has the potential, and I think a lot of, of people in Indian country, maybe say fear, have the potential of being a very much a, a landmark, significant case. And it all centers around uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was passed in the late 70s to, to address the, uh, the issue of Native children effectively being removed from their homes by uh, child Protective Services, so 25 to 30 percent of all Native children, at, at least one study around the time, were being removed from their homes, 85 percent of whom were being placed in non-Native homes, so they were in effect being uh, taken from their, from their tribes and their community, and one of the things that, that the law established was a preference for Native uh, children to be placed with either extended family members or in, in Native foster homes. Now, it's not a requirement that they are, but it creates this, this preference. And this is something that's very central to, to much of, uh, and much of Indian country, right? Because this was to protect the best interests of Indian children and promote the stability and security of the tribes and families. That's literally the text in the law. And so it's, it's generally been seen as successful. Some refer to it as a gold standard. And in Indian country, it's held with great, uh, it's viewed very positively. This is a policy that one is meant to address these uh, policies of the past uh, that broke families apart. And again, this is 1978, it's passed. So this is not that distant of the past uh, that uh, the, the separation was going on at that high of a rate. And it's still at a much higher rate today than it is for non-natives. But the, nonetheless, the law has had a lot of impact. And this law is being challenged at the Supreme Court right now. And so that's really what this is, project has come to, to look at, is how this challenge and the potential uh, overturning of this law, uh, sort of how that affects people in Indian country. And, and the challenge stems from attempts by uh, several non-Native couples to adopt Native children. They, they'd fostered them and gotten close, and they wanted to adopt them, but because the children uh, either were uh, citizens of a, a tribal nation or eligible to be uh, uh, citizens, they were effectively blocked from doing so without getting into too many of the, the nitty gritty details, but it made it more difficult. Some of them actually did end up being able to adopt the children, but nonetheless have sued to say that the, the law is unconstitutional and it's worked its way up. They uh, started at a very sympathetic district court in Texas where the, the judge ruled that the whole law was unconstitutional. The Fifth Circuit, uh, an en banc ruling held it to be partly unconstitutional, and then everybody, so it didn't matter which side you were on, everyone decided it needed to go to the Supreme Court, and they held oral arguments just last November. So when I say that, you know, this project started uh, you know, with something very different in mind in terms of the specifics, this is sort of how it has, has evolved to, to look at this particular instance that, again, I think, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about in a second, has really the, the potential to upend a lot of, of, of life in, in Indian country. There's a lot of legal arguments. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of all of those, but there's one that's in partic particular uh, that's worth discussing because it, it's the one I think that most uh, Native Americans sort of fear the most in terms of the possibility of the, the court agreeing with, which is that the, the law violates the guarantee, uh, basically that the law violates the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause by treating Native children differently, and in their argument, because of race. So this is a quote from the, the plaintiffs, right, that the law applies even when a child is not a member of an Indian tribe and does not live on a reservation, and therefore it must be that the, the law is making a, a basis on race. 
And this is very concerning for uh, Native Americans and Native American Rights Fund in their amicus brief to the court even said it's the most concerning argument. Again, there are other arguments that are made, but this is the one that when we think about how people in the community are reacting, this is the, the, the line of argumentation that is most concerning. So you might be asking why? Why would this, this that seem so uh, unreasonable? And, and, the, and actually insofar that uh, out of the 574 federally recognized tribes, 497 of them have signed on to briefs defending the law. So they've argued against this claim along with a number of native organizations, 23 states, District of Columbia, Congress people from both parties. There's a wide range of organizations opposing this attempt to, to over, overturn ICWA, as it's called. And the basic uh, sort of logic here is that citizenship in a tribe is a political characteristic, not a racial one, in that uh, being a Native American in this sense is being a citizen of a sovereign nation that sets its own standards and requirements for membership. And that's the basis on which ICWA is, is made. And so I make this point to, I think it's an important one and, and throughout the project, but also I think just, just generally, this is my own moment of you know, public service sort of uh, edification point that the political nature of, of tribes Native American tribes and their relationship with, with the federal government is the basis for uh, everything from the, the treaty rights that tribes have to uh, the obligations that the, the federal government uh, has, to the, has to Native Americans. And so this is really a critical one, right, that it's, a, it's citizenship, it's membership. Uh, and again, different tribes have different requirements uh, for that. It's not simply my great grandmother said that in a fa our family once, you know, had a relative that was of this tribe. It's it's rather different than that, um, and that has important in legal, uh, political, social, economic consequences all all down the line. And the, that's basically the problem here is the or potential concern is if the court concluded that the native being a Native American is a racial category instead of a political one, then basically tribal sovereignty as we know it would be uh, severely threatened, could potentially effectively be dismantled uh, because that would require all of those agreements, all those treaties, regulations, everything from Indian Health Service to gaming to mineral rights and consulting on whether you put, uh, say, a pipeline through a reservation. If you recall the, the Keystone Pipeline protests at uh, Standing Rock uh, several years ago, and so on, all these aspects of self-government, governance and nation-to-nation uh, -nation relations could be undermined, if not outright stripped down, uh, in part because by, if you have a racial basis, then it has to meet what's called strict scrutiny. It's just a, a more difficult level of justification for federal legislation, and in effect would undo some 200 years worth of precedent that forms the basis of tribal relations with the federal government. So as one scholar put it, uh, it, it could have revolutionary and catastrophic consequences. And I don't think this is lost on uh, anyone really in, in Indian country. And just to, to underscore that point, I, I pulled some of the, the quotes and, and statements that tribal leaders have, have been making. This is from the, the Muscogee Nation, right? That talking about that ICWA and tribal rights are again under attack at the Supreme Court and to defend those principles. The tribes are political self-governing entities, right? And th this is the this is something that is both about ICWA itself, the the impact that it has on on children, and the ability of tribes to protect their citizens. But it also clearly goes beyond that and goes much further. And this was a statement by four uh, uh, tribal chairmen that were part of the case and their belief the Supreme Court will, will be on their side, right? And so again, to this question of uh, will the Supreme Court stand up as it were for, for tribal sovereignty and tribal rights. Uh, and then this was from the National Congress of American Indians, you know, the implications for children and families, but also the impact on, on tribal nations. 
right? This could set the precedent that could completely uh, undermine things like tribal economic development and land rights, that it's this direct threat to tribal sovereignty. And so there's those are clear legal implications, but I think the, the political and social implications are there as well. And that's what where I think this project is, is heading. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, the, the, again, this has the potential to fundamentally reshape how, how Native Americans view the legal system and the court in particular, just as, as McGirt had of this impact in my mind, but that was also relatively limited to a certain portion of Oklahoma where I'm from. ICWA affects all tribal nations, not just one or a few, oftentimes in, in federal Indian law, it's, it's cases involving one or, or two specific uh, tribes, but here it's it's all Native Americans are, are directly or potentially directly affected by this. And when you think of the history behind the law and the, the trauma that, that the law was meant to prevent from happening again, or at least to mitigate, uh, I think th this will certainly has the potential to uh, really resonate with, with people. And, and again, the, the impact on tribal sovereignty and, and with that tribe's ability to survive and to thrive in the the fact that so many native uh, tribes have been very forceful in their opposition to this effort, I think probably filters in or filters down to uh, you know, the, the broader, the broader uh, citizenry. On the other hand, again, this is a pending case, so I don't have the, the end of the story for you. Uh, perhaps if they uphold ICWA, if the law is upheld by the court, it might actually have a bolstering effect of confidence. So we see again, as I said at the beginning, that trust in the Supreme Court uh, broadly in the country is at a low, but perhaps this kind of decision that uh, would really serve as something of a, of a reassurance to Native Americans of the Supreme Court's uh, fidelity to the concept of tribal sovereignty would, would go some way in at least alleviating concerns and, and instilling confidence and trust in the institution. So that was a lot of buildup of, of the, the project as it were. That's the, the, the front end almost. Again, it, it, it has evolved as the, the conditions in the world have evolved. And the court's decisions expected by the end of the term this June, we don't know how they're gonna rule uh, with, with new membership. So the McGirt decision I've mentioned before, that was before Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing. And so there is a, a different composition of the court. And it's worth noting that in McGirt, it was a 5-4 decision with the opinion written by Neil Gorsuch, who actually being from uh, the Colorado and the circuit that often deals with Indian law, has generally been a fairly uh, strong ally of tribal, tribal sovereignty. But it's a, new, it's a new composition of the court, so it's unclear how, how that will, will end up. So in the coming months, next month in particular, I'm going to be conducting interviews with tribal leaders to, to get their perspective on these issues. So I've seen some of the statements, but actually to go and speak with uh, some of the, the leaders of, of important and, and large uh, tribes across the country, um, including uh, looking to go to the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in, in North Carolina, as well as a few uh, back in Oklahoma just to, to get a sense of, of their perspective on this and where they, where they think things are going. And this is coupled with a, a recently uh, a, a NSF award to conduct some surveys as well, including surveying Native Americans before and after the court's decision to, again, try and not just have the stories of the, the leaders of tribes, but also the, sort of, if you will, the, the everyday citizens of, of these tribal nations. So that's all coming here fairly soon. So I'll end it by saying stay tuned for a possible future event to, to discuss the decision and, and those findings as well. Thank you. Thanks so much to uh, all three. Yes, I, I love seeing the claps and uh, you know, all of this work is, is uh, very interesting, very exciting. and. Uh, very, very relevant and timely. So um, I'm going to wait to uh, see if we get some questions in the Q&A, but I had a couple. Uh, I always end up having a couple. I'm, I, I love fellows for this reason. My mind just really gets going. And um, 
you know, something I've been writing about in the newsletter quite a bit and something I've been thinking about is the importance of archives. And so um, then I'm direct my first question to Nancy and Sheena about what it meant to have the time and the resources to go to the proper archives and the sort of joy and unexpected um, act of discovery. So if you guys could both talk about that a little bit, um, don't worry, Jay, I have one for you too. <laughs> so I can start. Um, when I first moved to West Virginia to work at WVU, I quickly um, made contact with Lori Hostetler at the West Virginia Regional History Center. And she really helped me to understand that I needed to ask for what I wanted. And she would always bring me box. I would say, I think I want something like this. And she would bring me boxes of stuff to go through. So when I went to Scotland, I realized because I had tried to get archives, I had tried to get material before then. I thought they would email me things. No, you have to go and you have to sit. So it was a very high security. Every time I took something out, it was high security. I would go, they would scan my body. I, that was the most security I had when I was in Scotland. They would scan my body, check my bag, and then they would hand me something and they would say, you can use a pencil. And I had done that in the New York City Library when I handled 100-year-old dime novels. But it was interesting that I was only handling things that were 40 years old or 50 years old. So it meant a great deal to me to be able to sit there every day and just pull different items out of the box that they gave me and then look at them carefully. I could take pictures um, because otherwise I wouldn't have discovered what I did about women, Italian women who migrated to Scotland. There's no way I could have really started to do the research that I did. And I really appreciated being able to do that. I think in like manner. Um, so I think I briefly mentioned that my first book was on Booker T. Washington's third wife. And one of the, the things about choosing the third wife was that one, she's living until 1925, right? And so in spaces where she could recreate her early narrative, much of her things were in papers and in she's creating these national organizations. And so, so much um, is there to the point where it's deciding what can fit in the book, what can't fit in this book, what has to go into something else. And I think in, in doing this archival dig, I went in extremely hesitant. And Leah can tell you like in the beginning, I was like, I'm starting off with this article on the two women because one, oftentimes when they're spoken of, they're really one dimensional, right? They were the wives of Booker T. Washington. Um, his first wife had his daughter. His second wife had his first two sons. Both of them died very shortly after giving birth, right? And so the second, uh, Olivia Davidson is, is dying three months after giving birth to her second son. And so that usually is, and then Booker T. Washington does like a quick shout out inside of his um, biography where he's like, um, Olivia Davidson came and she really helped me connect with um, donors within the North. And then she dies, right? And, and it's nothing else. And so I think I went into the archives nervous that how am I going to find her voice? And I think oftentimes what I was able to do um, that I kind of spoke of was how do I reimagine these, I know these Black women existed, right? I know they were born, even though the archives doesn't say that they were born. And so thinking about it that way, it really just allowed me to be extremely creative, extremely creative in one, where I was going. So for example, one of the archives that um, I was able to go to and really find so much of her narrative was her school that she was at in, in Massachusetts at Framingham. And so looking at that archives, because she's reaching out to them once she's in Tuskegee, many of the students who then become prominent educators 
are writing back to their, their main mistress about Olivia. And so then this opens up a wealth that this institution has had that's retelling this story about not only who this woman was before she got to um, this graduate program, but also the things that she's able to do afterwards and how the students are like sewing um, underwear together for students in Tuskegee, how Olivia is telling them to go to their local churches and really showing them how to be philanthropists. So I'll just say that the archives has been, um, it's been fascinating to one, to be able to sit with the information, to be able to then say, oh, wait, she went to school with this let me go to the archives now in um, Harlem because she went to school with this man, right? And then you go to that archives and he's talking about being in school with Olivia Davidson. And at the time, he didn't know who Olivia Davidson was going to be, but because he's then connected with her husband, he's talking about their connection that they didn't even know that they had. Right? And so it's been really fascinating creating an archive for this woman that did not exist prior to me starting this research. And I think that's been one of the more invaluable things on, I was really hesitant of doing another biography, but the importance of understanding that these people, they exist and their stories are there to be told. And why not be the one that tells them and, and really be able to sit through um, these silences and what they ultimately mean. And, and who they ultimately were. And so it's been amazing. And I'm, I'm really excited to finish the project and present Olivia to the world. And I think that this, this fellowship just was very, very important. And one, getting me to see that there's a larger story that could be told, but also giving me the funding to be able to just sit and, and sit with these, with these silences. So, yeah. You know, uh, it, it's it's exciting to watch people who have been in archives um, around the same time listen to each other talk about our archives because you just see the light up moments. And um, something that uh, I personally have learned about them is that they really do spur creativity. And I'm so glad that that came out of your answers. So, um, so Jay, my question to you, and then I have uh, questions from the audience too. But um, so your work, um, it's super timely and relevant, right? And and you come from political science and um, probably do a lot of um, social science uh, research. But this is also, this is research to me that's like, it's, it, it could have that component, but it also is, is deeply in the humanities. And I, I was wondering if you could talk about being somebody who's kind of working in these blurred spaces and then having on top of that, and I really appreciated too, the personal element of um, this affecting Indian communities and Indian nations and Indian sovereignty of which you are a part of, right? And so um, it, it seems like a, a lot of things that, um, it, you know, we would want to silo in the academy, all of a sudden are very blurred. Um, and and, and uh, the more that you are talking about, about this and, and that will have real world implications, 200 years of case law, right? Just completely changed. Um, so I was hoping you could talk about that. I can try. I, mean, I, th I think it's, it's uh, often the case, especially working when it's like you have the law and society. I mean, that's kind of what this is in a sense is, is a law and society that, that it's multidisciplinary. I mean, it's, it both is, and I, coming from a social science background, like that probably was pretty clear at times, but then there's also clear applications here, I think, to telling the stories of a community that often aren't told. And, and I think this, this case is a particularly instructive one on both fronts. I think that's part of what makes it so interesting is that I say interesting, also terrifying in a way like the, the I mean, to be, to be quite, Frank, in terms of the possible consequences, uh, but but that you see both the the macro level kinds of of potential implications, but there's also very much the micro level, the individual. Like when I hear, you know, back home, well, now with this, you know, the other decision, now law enforcement is different. And there's very much on the ground, like how people perceive any number of things changed from 
tribes had to, you know, completely recalibrate their their legal their their judicial system to handle cases that they weren't handling before, and what that means for how you interact with police, how you interact with one another in right in any number of circumstances. So uh, it, it's I guess the it's a blessing and curse in a way of being at the in the sort of legal whatever it is you want to call it world but i think maybe law and society but I, I like to think of it as a positive in the sense that it allows you to to use the insights from both sides of that coin to speak to one another that the you know like to go speak with tribal leaders and to hear their perspective on this is also informative then of on the social science side and vice versa, seeing what how people are reacting and what does that mean for their their you know daily lives? I mean, I think that's really what's what's really driven me with this is we've heard a lot about the Supreme Court's decisions having direct impacts, right? Very, you know, very clear impacts on on how people live across this country. And this is just another example of that, but it's an example that's in a, a kind of specific community in a specific issue that I, I hope at least in part to to increase awareness or at least contribute to the conversation of to bring that into the discussion. I think that was an awesome answer to a very complex question. So thank you. Um, you know, we're getting a little close on time, but we do have a question from the audience. Um, so I want to ask, can Nancy talk more about her opening statement of feeling safe in Scotland like she does not in the U.S.? Curious if this is a physical safety, a mental, or both? Both. Um, I wasn't expecting, um, I wasn't expecting what happened when I arrived in Scotland. Um, in the United States in the last, I would say, seven years, I've become very aware of of how unsafe groups of people are, right? Um, the proliferation of guns in this country, just as a baseline, and then the violence against certain groups. Um, and in West Virginia right now, we have an attack on transgender folks, right? Very clear attack, I think. Um, it gives me pause because when anyone of my community is unsafe, I also feel unsafe for them. So I'm unsafe myself, but I also feel unsafe for them. And when I was in Scotland, that was when Roe versus Wade was overturned. And I remember I was at a open air market and I had just gotten this great Ethiopian food and was sitting down with this couple from Glasgow, young couple who had moved. And I was started talking to them about it because I just needed to talk about it. And the the husband who was all of maybe 28 years old looked at me and he went, what? He just couldn't understand what had happened. He just, he had no um, vocabulary to say, but wait, that's your choice. So I suddenly realized that I was in a place where I was safer, other populations were safer. And then when the queen died, I happened to be at Balmoral by accident. I was driving home from the from the Highlands because I rented a car for a week in order to interview Laura Presetti. And I got lost on the way home and it was raining and I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna fall off a cliff and hit a sheep. And, and it was raining so hard that I saw this car park, Balmoral car park, and I pulled in and I was as I was pulling in, the prime ministers were pulling out. So I was there two days before the queen died and there were police and security and newspapers everywhere. And they, the police didn't even give me a second glance because they weren't interested in me, right? But none of the police had any weapons on them. They didn't have Kevlar vests. They didn't carry grenades. They didn't carry guns. And I was actually told that any police, there's only one police officer that ever is allowed to carry a gun and they have to sit in their car. And the only time they get out of the car is when they're going to use the gun. Now, when the queen's body came through Edinburgh, there were sharpshooters probably on the roof, but I didn't, I didn't see them. I was told, yeah, they're up there. But it really felt like everybody could be responsible. So even people who protested could be were considered somewhat responsible, though I know that a few people got arrested for holding up blank signs, which was just fascinating to me. Um, 
So my mind relaxed in a way that I realized it hadn't relaxed in a long time with all the all the political machinations that are happening in this country. Um, and then when I went to Rome, it completely shut down because every corner had militarized police. Um, so it's about, for me, it really is about violence against my body, against other bodies. That I think is very real. I think we were under threat. I don't know if I should say that, but I just did. So, <laughs> but I feel like there are many people in our communities that are under threat every day. And to, to feel like that wasn't happening really relaxed me in a way that I hadn't been relaxed in seven years. And just as a follow-up for that um, in the Q and A, uh, sounds like an excellent piece for the conversation. Thanks for sharing. Great. So. <laughs> Which I, I would concur. And, you know, one of the great things about this, this particular group of fellows is that there's so much more work that's going to come out of the work that you guys have done um, during this fellowship period. I'm excited for the books. I'm excited to see, I mean, we're all like, I have June now starred <laughs> so that I can follow uh, the Supreme Court case. I think all of these things uh, really make this uh, vibrant and ongoing research. I want to thank you for giving your time tonight. I'd like to thank our audience for being here. Um, I'm just very excited about this research that's been funded by the center. Um, and uh, to conclude, uh, just remind a few people that we have our last research week event tomorrow uh, at, in the uh, lower level of the library, uh, Classroom 104. It's a book discussion uh, on Melissa Bank with uh, Lisa DeFrank Cole, who is the winner of the Outstanding Researcher Award from the International Leadership Association. So we're excited about that. And then on Monday night, we will conclude uh, the center's events uh, by hosting uh, Mike Ingram, who is the author of a memoir called Notes from the Road. So that is Monday evening at 730 in the Milano room in the downtown library. And I have been told there will be cupcakes. So with that, I want to uh, thank our fellows and wish everybody a good evening. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Sheena. And